Hello and welcome to the August uh, Microsoft product terms updates from the version one software asset management team. How's everybody doing today? Very good. good thanks, Carl. Carl. Not a huge amount of updates this month. I guess uh, we, we all thought there'd be like a an array of meaty updates uh, off the back of the Inspire conference, which took place in July. Uh, but uh, but yeah, things are pretty thin on the ground, fair to say. So uh, William, what's uh, what what's, what what have, what have you found in the terms this month? Yeah, so it could actually be quite an interesting one, but with a bit of a backstory, but one that we may never hear. But it's an update to the uh, Microsoft Teams um, health sector customers clause um, with language regarding medical records. So we would only be surmising and. and um, guessing on, on what that backstory might be on why they've changed the, the language with regard to medical records. But I suppose um, if I just quickly go through what the changes are, we might be able to um, pretty much guess what they're, why, why they've done this. So specifically for health sector customers, um, the, the, the new terms, language of the terms is, is that the customer, i.e. The, the NHS provider or Health Ireland provider, is solely responsible for a number of items such as um, accuracy and adequacy of information and data that is furnished through the use of teams. Um, they have to ensure that they're implementing a secure application to application authentication method between any customer application and or teams. So the, the I suppose the healthcare provider is now responsible for ensuring that security piece is in place um, between teams and whatever they're using it for. Um, and I think the key one as well is the um, they must obtain appropriate consent from end users um, when connecting uh, end users and the customer's use of Teams. So uh, again, we can only really sort of be guessing, but I should imagine that an awful lot of medical records is, is transferred or, or been used through Teams over time, over the last couple of years, um, yeah. without possibly, um, allegedly, the correct governance and controls in place on who can access those records for how long and um, under what context that, that they can actually view those records. Um, so the, the final piece that they've put into place is that um, any information that, that provided by the, the, the health provider um, or its patients and teams, including meeting recordings, um, as well as virtual appointment services, um, Basically, it's, it's absolutely 100% down to the provider to make sure that everything is secure and in place and um, no, no maintenance of legal medical records or, um, are, are maintained in teams and it's not deemed as a, a storage vestibule for, for any patient records. Because of um, course, teams relies on, it needs SharePoint and OneDrive. SharePoint, it's OneDrive. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I suppose the ability for people to spin up new channels, new conversations, new meetings, new private yeah. chat even. Um, so and how is that governed at the provider? Who's access the, the, to it the, for, even from an external provider. guest access point of yeah. view, yeah. Yeah. This is a pretty uh, timely update as well because uh, at Inspire there's quite a lot of talk around first line worker and the first line worker opportunity and you know I think that Microsoft gave out some statistic that 80% of the world's workforce are first line workers. And I think that the key takeaway I got from, from one particular session was that there was going to be more of an emphasis on driving first line worker subscriptions into the marketplace, which is, you know, really well suited within the uh, health sector, right, where you have um, users that might not need at full uh, knowledge worker type experience, but would need many of the key elements associated with uh, with you know with Microsoft 365 like basic email, Teams, SharePoint, etc. So a uh, timely update in that context. And that probably links in then with and uh, the other change, which was, in my opinion, a key one regarding the device um, the, the mobile, de, well, the device screen limitation, which used to be at uh, 10.1 inches uh, for F SKUs, and that's been increased now to 10.9 inch 
And I think that will, and that's particularly when you look into it, it's the it's for the rights to run, you know, office uh, mobile apps. So, you know, it doesn't apply, obviously, to the likes of office, you know, online or office, office web apps. Um, but the office mobile apps where you've got the full kind of edit capabilities, even though they're, they're lightweight apps, obviously, that can run on these devices. And just like I just had a look at one of the the main kind of consumer suppliers of um, of devices, you know, and um, yeah. computers, TVs and so on. And um, yeah, it looks as though like in the likes of Apple iPad Air, that's a biggie. I mean, a lot of, I suppose, the, um, you know, the Samsungs and so on um, would fall into that bracket. So it, I mean, look, it's, it's good news and probably follows in line with what you were saying, you know, yeah. about their their vision really for kind of them um, um, frontline or, or more light users rather yeah. than your standard knowledge information worker, you know. That that screen size one is often overlooked, and I think the other the other trend that I see is you know there's there's quite a lot of Chromebooks out there as well, which are you know not mm. too dissimilar from a traditional laptop in in form factor a lot of the time. So yeah, it's a it's an interesting one. I think a lot of people overlook it, that screen size piece. So it's good to good to see that there's some flexibility there because it is a, a license compliance risk if you know if you get it wrong. Yeah, it's, it's not actually enforceable, is it? In you know, there's no um automatic enforcement of it it's a it's a, a trust yeah. compliance piece isn't it but yeah yeah but under audit it's pretty yeah. easy one yeah. to capture because you, you could yeah. just profile all the manufacturer models mm. that are in use and work back from there yeah yeah interesting yeah definitely i'll touch on the well the the three boring stuff well three maybe two actually so the first one will be the Microsoft Learning um, update that they put in there, um, pretty straightforward. They simply removed references to the Imagine Academy, and they've now placed the offer um, to be provided via if you get an education license agreement. Um, so that's that's the first one, pretty straightforward. Um, the second would be the subscription license suites. Um, they've just added Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Plan 1 to the Microsoft 365 um, Enterprise and Education Tables. And the third one, which is the extremely intelli uh, intelligent and interesting one rather, is the Microsoft um, Defender Experts for Hunting. Um, if you click on it, nothing comes up. So nothing, nothing nobody to say there. <laughs> yeah. so, and nobody's so noticed. It just seems no. to be, you know. It's, yeah, I think I'd it's say, quite an exciting I, product though within the Defender set or an yes. interesting addition I mean it's very much sentinel and arc but you know it's all that sort of pro proactive threat management threat attack you know mm. advanced threat analytics piece isn't it Absolutely. but yeah I think it's something to keep thing. an eye on over the next few weeks maybe I'd yeah. say there's most likely a change coming up with regards to it um maybe somebody just jumped the gun mm. a bit there um, but I'd say Microsoft it's something Microsoft to expect ahead of Microsoft engineering which exactly amazing. yeah William, have you seen anything on the CSP price list for it? No. Okay. That's interesting. So it's hardly just available through, you know, any of the enterprise programs. That's fair. Just doing, yeah. Mm, that's fair. We, we just won't know, I suppose, until someone actually yeah. notices <laughs> <laughs> that like there's that nothing there for us. I looked at some fun stuff. So I looked at uh, the home <laughs> use program. Uh, or what was formerly known as the home use program, which is now the workplace discount program, which I guess is designed to align with Microsoft's branding around things like modern workplace and so forth. So there's no changes to the terms associated with, with the program. And um, I suppose anybody who's familiar with the program may have got some benefit from it in the past where you were able to purchase uh, on premise and cloud subscriptions at a heavily discounted rate assuming your organization was eligible for the program itself yeah. um right now if you look at the workplace discount programs a couple of key elements to it, it you know it gives you i think it's somewhere around the region of a 30 percent discount on microsoft 365 subscriptions yeah. 
there's a 10% or so discount on surface devices. So I suppose the best way to figure out if you qualify for the program, uh, simply check out Microsoft.com workplace discount program. Um, and you can pump in your company email, not your personal email, your company email. And that kicks off a verification process whereby you can then start to see if you qualify for the program based on the number of licenses or subscriptions that your your employer is purchasing from Microsoft. So it costs you nothing to check it out. Uh, definitely worth looking and having a see in terms of um, the program itself. Uh, you know, you might be subscribing to Microsoft or Office 365 using uh, regular pricing, regular retail pricing. This gives you an opportunity if you qualify to get a nice enough discount. Um, and I think there's, there's a, a couple of things I, I might be speaking out of turn on this, but um, I believe that if you leave the organization or if your organization leaves the program, there's still an opportunity to continue to maintain that subscription discount, assuming you yeah. don't let the discount lapse. So quite a lot of flexibility there. And again, on, on surface devices, there's a 10% discount based on um, surface devices and I think accessories as well. So so pretty, pretty yeah. good. That, that's it, Carl. Um, in the traditional kind of home use program, um, if if you bought, you know, I, th I think the for the home use program, it used to be offer standard, you know, that they would um, provide you know, as part of the home use. You, if you left the organisation through which you got that benefit, then you were supposed to deinstall the software. You didn't have the right to use it, um, yeah. thereafter. But um. Yeah, with the the new workplace uh, discount program, you know it's it's in perpetuity that you've the rights to renew your subscription, no matter kind of where you know if you move on to another employer or retire or whatever. So, um, that's a benefit. And I think um I was just saying there that mine I signed up to it a couple of years ago. Yeah, they did have some kind of limits. I think I am um, on, you know, the number of subscriptions that your organization had to have. I think probably a lot of that is gone yeah. now because look, you know, I mean, the the aim is, you know, they want people kind of use in the office suites, you know, no matter what. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was so somewhere around 2000 users was historically. Um, but I, I think the quickest way to figure out if you, you qualify for it or not is just visit the, the workplace discount program website. And as I said, pump in your email there. Um, I know historically, when you look at the home use program, there was sometimes a bit of back and forth with IT stakeholders trying to figure out how to get on it, etc. So this is real kind of self-service. I, I went in and had a play around with it there myself yesterday and nearly bought a Surface, but then ended up <laughs> ended up changing my mind. But uh, definitely, I will revisit it again at, at a later date. The, I guess would would it maybe would there be anything to do with kind of support or I suppose Microsoft would still honor warranties, you know, for yeah, you can buy you can, so you can still yeah, you can buy like a uh, accidental cover and all that good stuff. So it's all yeah, you know, it, it, it can, there's no kind of deterioration in terms of what you can access. It's it's you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. And so that's maybe yeah, as as maybe devices as well, old kind of personal um, devices are not Windows 11 ready, and I presume at some stage they're going to stop supporting Windows 10 completely. Because I had that experience just with upgrading um, home devices to Windows 10, and um, yeah, that's that's not going to be around forever. And sure, that's the name of the game anyway, isn't it? Um, so yeah, sorry, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, so I think that's it from all the updates this month. I I think we pretty much covered it all. There wasn't a huge amount there to to report on. Um, who knows next month we might see some interesting updates. I think we always say that. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any Microsoft licensing queries uh, that you need a, some guidance or advice on, do feel free to reach out to the team here at version one. We'd be delighted to help you in, in, in whatever way. Um, also check out the blog associated with this monthly video blog. Um, it's on Medium uh, where you'll find uh, blogs from myself and a whole host of Microsoft topics uh, that also interlink with blogs from the wider SAM team who are here today on the call on all things Microsoft. And I know Richard's done some pretty good stuff on Red Hat as well. So do check that out. Uh, so until next month, we shall see you then. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone.